This episode is brought to you by Private Internet Access. Learn more at the end of this video. This series is going to be full of spoilers. Only the first paragraph or two will be devoid of spoilers. I also curse like a sailor at times. Don't say I didn't warn you. Between the first episode and this episode, while I love Hackers, SLC Punk definitely flies higher in what it seeks to achieve. Hackers is a popcorn flick with a heavy focus on visual flair, the soundtrack, the overall style, and the humor in the script. SLC Punk, while humorous, not only has a fairly profound message at the end, but is probably my favorite coming of age film there is. First, let's start with Stevo. Stevo is the protagonist of this film and also acts as the narrator for anything going on throughout the movie that needs additional explanation. What I love about this is that the nature of this changes with the ending of the movie, but I'll save that for the end of the video. Aside from being the film's narrator and protagonist, he's a young punk in his formative years in the 1980s living in Salt Lake City as the name implies. He makes it very apparent to his parents that he blames them for bringing him to Salt Lake City from New York. It's funny, I never put it together, but the main character of Hackers and SLC Punk have opposite complaints. Dade hates that he lives in New York City, where he was used to and loved the scenery of Washington State. Again, as a former Washingtonian, I can relate. Steve-O, on the other hand, grew up in and appreciated New York for what it was, in his words, the mecca and hub of popular culture, and loathes living in Utah, a state that while oppressed by its laws due to it being the Mormon state is visually quite beautiful. Yeah, there's deserts, but there's also a lot of trees in Utah. Steve's problem with it has to do with it being far removed from popular culture. It seems to me that Steve's dad also to some degree doesn't enjoy living in Utah, though his stated complaint is about the women, not the state itself. Enough about Steve-O though. Let's look at the beginning of the movie. No, not the very beginning, which kind of shows what drives the punks, but after their opening credit roll. Actually, shit. Let's play the main point of that intro, then I'll get to what I was getting at. The thing about me and Bob, and pretty much all of us was, we hated rednecks more than anything else, period. Because rednecks for us were America incarnate. And America? <laughs> well, fuck America. <laughs> What could I say? We weren't much more than a couple of young punks. It wouldn't be a movie about anarchist punks if it didn't play sex and violence by the exploited, now would it? Anyway, the part I'm talking about is here, where they're in their place where they're squatting and Bob, aka Heroin Bob, is laying on his bed and Steve-O comes up to him to wake him up. This part I would say is sort of the establishing shot because it shows a lot of what is driving these guys and says a lot more about them and the era than one would think. Beer cans and bottles laying all over, a picture of Ronald Reagan just chilling there next to the anarchy symbol spray painted on the wall behind him, records and a record player, likely only punk rock in their collection, and last but certainly not least, Reagan's face on a dartboard, notably with a Nazi swastika on his forehead, to really set the mood for their anarchist headquarters. Steve-O then walks over to Bob and lightly kicks him, more like a nudge, to try and wake him up, but Bob is probably still drunk from the night before, implied by the beer can still in his sleeping hand. Keep this in mind as we get closer to the end of the video, where I'm going to be bringing things full circle when talking about the themes of the movie. After this introduction to the two showing their place, the movie spends some time explaining how Bob got the name Heroin Bob. Now it's funny because Bob hated drugs, especially needles, and only smoked cigarettes and drank. It's funny because Bob's irrational fear of needles made him have a massive infection in his hand after punching a mirror because he hates mirrors. Instead of disinfecting the wound and dressing it properly, then changing the dressing every once in a while when it got too soaked with blood, he just used an old t-shirt to stop the bleeding and left it at that for weeks for it to fester. This definitely sets the tone for what kind of person Bob is as the movie progresses. Anyway, 
After a short detour through the hospital, the movie flashes over to Bob giving Steve-O shit for using acid and drugs in general, going on about how Napoleon Bonaparte was poisoned over a long period of time while in exile, and how after his death it was found and known that he was poisoned because of traces of arsenic found in Napoleon's hair. The whole point of that was to make Steve-O feel bad for using drugs because it stays in your system, which is a fair point, particularly with harder drugs. Then Bob tells the story about how Sean, one of their friends, got permafried because he ran through sprinklers while carrying acid in his pocket and brings the whole story around once again to make Steve-O feel bad. Bob went over to Sean's place only to find him crouched on top of a chair on his patio, thinking everything around him is water and that Bob is Jesus walking on water. The theme of drug use comes back in the end as well. The next handful of scenes are probably my favorite, though I think that's because they're all when the anarchist party is still in full swing, and things weren't looking so bad for Steve-O and Bob. The scene following Bob being put into a quarantine because of his infection got so bad that it turned into a lethal virus, is Steve-O talking about the anarchist goal to cause damage to the system, and how his parents tried getting him to go to college, leading into this beautifully cathartic rant toward his parents who are preaching about how they want him to be free and rebel at Harvard and how it's all because they love him. And then he comes back swinging full force with... You believe in rebellion, freedom, and love, right? Absolutely. Rebellion, freedom, yes. love. <laughs> you two are divorced, so love failed. Rounding it off with the best part, which is... I love you guys! Don't get me wrong! It's all about this, but for the first time in my life, I'm 18 and I can say, Fuck you! I know this is coming off like a book report, but stick with me. There's a reason I'm giving a breakdown to most of the major scenes of the movie. The next few scenes are Steve-O going off about anarchy yet again, talking about how in SLC there's just as many posers as actual punks, then they go to a punk rock show and things get rough as Bob jumps on a stage and gets beat up by the bouncer, which then causes Mike, played by Jason Siegel, to go on stage and beat up the bouncer. The point of this scene happens after the show, at the after party, where Steve-O says the following. ECP, Extreme Corporal Punishment, one of the toughest, most hardcore bands in the UK. They come to Salt Lake City, they think it's too tough for them. An 18-year-old punk beat the shit out of their bouncer. I rest my case on this. In a country of lost souls, rebellion comes hard. But in a religiously oppressive city, which half its population isn't even of that religion, it comes like fire. This is then followed by Bob being discharged from the hospital and the start of a party. While the party isn't all too important, it gives for some introduction to different characters, as well as a little bit of foreshadowing coming from Mark's flashback. I'll bring that around again later. The party also has the explanation of why they go to Wyoming to get beer, to quickly summarize, Mostly has to do with cops and yet again, religious oppression where most alcohol is half the percentage unless it's from a state-run liquor store. The problem with that of course being that since they are punks, they are quote unquote suspicious and so they often had the cops sent after them if going to a state-run liquor store. Which kind of makes that a moot option. The most important thing to come from the party is right about the halfway point of the movie. It marks the beginning of the fall. The fight. What does it mean and where does it come from? An essay. Homo sapien. A man. He is alone in the universe. A punker. Still a man. He is alone in the universe. But he connects. How? They hit each other. Ooh. No clear way to evaluate whether or not you're alive. Now. Complications. A reason to fight. Somebody different. Difference creates dispute. Dispute is a reason to fight and to fight is a reason to feel pain. Life is pain. So to fight, with reason, is to be alive, with reason. Final analysis, the fight, a reason to live. Problems and contradictions. I am an anarchist. I believe there should be no rules, only chaos. Fighting appears to be chaos, and when we slam in a pit at a show, it is. But when we fight for a reason like rednecks, there's a system. We fight for what we stand for, chaos. Fighting is a structure. Fighting is to establish power, power is government, and government is not anarchy. Government is war, and war is fighting. The circle goes like this. 
Our redneck skirmishes are cheaper versions of conventional warfare. Because wars are fought to enforce ideals, even freedom, but other people's ideals forced on someone else, even if it is something like freedom, is still rule, not anarchy. This contradiction was becoming clear to me in the fall of 85. Even as early as my first party, why did I love to fight? I framed it, but I still didn't understand it. It goes against my beliefs as a true anarchist. But there it was. Competition, fighting, capitalism, government, the system. It's what we did, it's what we always did. Rednecks kicked the shit out of punks, punks kicked the shit out of mods, mods kicked the shit out of skinheads, skinheads took out the heavy metal guys, the heavy metal guys beat the living shit out of the new wavers, and the new wavers did nothing. They were the new hippies. What was the point? Final summation? None. And now, on with the show. Well, Steve may have had no point to garner, but there is a point. Despite his attempts at being as punk and true to anarchy as he can, Steve can only go so far as a punk. There is always a system. Let's continue, this goes deeper later. Remember how I said that this was the beginning of the fall? Well, I wasn't pulling your leg. From here, Mark leaves to go back to Miami, presumably to die because he had problems in Miami he had to take care of, and he never returned despite saying he would. People then theorize that he died in a plane crash like he should have all those years ago, but, you know, that's hearsay. I'm just assuming that he died one way or the other, whether it was in a plane crash or if it was because of the crime-related guys that he had to deal with back in Miami. One way or the other, I think that Mark just ended up dying. Bob starts spending more time with Trish, which Steve-O thinks of as something that's removing him from his punk roots. Steve-O's dad takes him to lunch after pressuring him to go to school for law since Steve-O already did pre-law. Steve-O and Sandy see Sean as a bum because he lost his mind after the acid destroyed his mind and made him unable to get a job. Steve-O grows regrets because instead of facing facts, he turned his back on Sean. Steve-O and Sandy then go to the park and drop acid to further not face the facts and has what I would describe as a pretty bad trip featuring a blood-drenched creek and a nuclear holocaust. Steve-O gives Bob shit for being in love with Trish and that only posers fall in love. About an hour into the movie, Steve-O recognizes that his foundation is starting to fall apart. And then there's this party at Chris's. Chris was mentioned but not introduced at the party at the place Steve-O and Bob squat in. He was mentioned in reference to his sister, Jennifer, which Steve-O heavily makes clear that she needs to be medicated because she isn't quite right when she's off her meds and is potentially dangerous or as Steve describes her as a carnivore. Now this girl, absolutely beautiful, sweet as pie, is the greatest child God ever put on this earth, but you do not want to mess with her when she hasn't had her medication in a dark, deserted alley. She will, I repeat, she will rip your head off. This girl is a carnivore. Look, carnivore. Nya, nya, nya. Be careful. When he arrives in this strangely satisfying transition between scenes, Jennifer isn't on her medication and is acting quite peculiar as a result with apparent hypersensitivity. Shortly after, Steve-O goes into Chris's room where he's smoking, trying to get high but unable to. What's interesting is that we never see him as Steve-O described him at the last party, which was a death punk rock guy. Instead, we see a hippie in front of Steve-O, nearly crying from not seeing Steve-O in too long and going in for a hug. Here, Steve-O questions Chris about Jennifer. Why'd you tell Jennifer to get off her medication? I you know, she completely is out of her mind when she's off her medication. Why Isn't she beautiful? I mean, have you seen her gown? That's my sister. I mean, she's not a lithium Barbie doll. That's she needs to be who she is. Yes. And, and she should be who she is. But who she is... It's evaporating. I, well, I don't think she really knows who she is. I, I think we're starting to talk about pain here, yeah, Steve-O. And, and human that. being must go through pain. Ultimately, that doesn't really go anywhere, but they then quickly get onto their usual debate, the topic of which should come as no surprise. As Steve-O describes it, he and Chris have been having an ongoing debate about the nature of life, whether it's anarchy and chaos or order, and Chris seemed to be winning. Ultimately, it comes down to this. You know, uh, life goes from order to disorder to order. 
atoms come together randomly to form a, a structure. An infant is born, it grows, it, it gets older, it dies, it decomposes exactly. back into the ground in, into chaos. But then those atoms are reformed into something else. A blade of grass, a tree, a flower, whatever. The cycle, man. I got it. Steve. Cycle, man. Yeah, I get you. This is a major theme in the movie, and we'll come back around at the end along with a few other points mentioned earlier. Anyway, this theme is expanded upon shortly afterward when Steve-O goes looking for Sandy and ends up finding her having sex with someone else. They had an agreement that it wasn't a committed relationship, but as he described it, the guy was invading his territory. Steve-O was following nature, and nature is order, and nature is the system. Steve-O beat the shit out of him. It's this point that hits Steve-O hard in the foundation to the point that he says the following. Jones didn't need to prove the devil did not exist, not as a supernatural being, because I have seen the devil. He was in that room with Sandy. He was me, he was Harvard, he was my mom and dad, and all of us. Jones was just making it all up anyway. I thought, fuck him. I thought, fuck him, fuck this party, and fuck everything. Above all, fuck anarchy. So as you can see, Steve was really starting to fall apart into disarray. He's not able to hold himself together very well, and the very things he's lived his life believing are starting to fall under his feet. It's here that Steve-O and Bob have an altercation where Steve-O gets pissed off because Bob starts having fondness for Salt Lake City. Oh, God forbid. Fondness for your hometown. Oh. <laughs> Mike, the guy who thought the cars on his street would look better without windshields, was ditching anarchy for becoming a botanist. Bob was definitely in love. They go to visit Bob's dad, who is a 100% but fucking sane, and thinks the CIA is after him. This part is the ultimate send off to this movie, where all of the points come around full circle. So Bob and Trish invited Steve-O out to a party. It's the birthday of a rich girl named Brandy. But as Steve-O says, that's all right, I'm a rich boy, right? So they're at the party and Steve-O immediately falls in love with Brandy. They talk the entire time and then she asked, Why do you go out of your way to look like a bomb? Naturally, this perplexes Steve-O as he doesn't see the punk fashion style as something the likes of a bum. She then further expands by asking, wouldn't it be more of an act of rebellion if you didn't spend so much time buying blue hair dye and going out to get punky clothes? It seems so petty. You want to be an individual, right? You look like you're wearing a uniform and you look like a punk. That's not rebellion. That's fashion. Then what's rebellion? Rebellion happens in the mind. You can't create it. You just are that way. This is really what makes Steve-O change. He hates that he did and feels like he's cursed but goes with it anyway. Unfortunately, here's where the sad part happens. Bob drinks too much at the party, someone offers him vitamins, quote unquote. He goes home with Steve-O and dies in his sleep. The vitamins were Percodin, which when mixed with mass amounts of alcohol, caused him to overdose. Yes, the movie is well aware of the irony that heroin Bob, the man scared shitless by drugs, dies of a narcotics overdose. It's heartbreaking. It really is, and it's made me cry on countless occasions. I've been watching this movie for about as long as I've been watching Hackers, and it never fails to make me sad. However, there's a point to all this. So you saw the curve, where things are looking up, they're going okay, and then things start getting worse and worse until finally Bob dies. This comes full circle as Steve-O recounts how Bob got Steve-O into this punk lifestyle to begin with. They were nerds in their basement playing D&D together, listening to Rush. Bob comes in for their regularly scheduled session, but instead of that, Bob has a tape with punk music on it, their first introduction to it all. Remember how I mentioned the kick in the beginning where Steve-O goes to wake up Bob? Steve-O does the same thing when he discovers he's dead. Before, he was just asleep, but now, heroin Bob, the guy who was so afraid of drugs that he wouldn't even take an aspirin, has died from a narcotics overdose. The cycle, man. The movie ends where it began, at this bed where Bob lay silently waiting for Steve-O to try waking him. It goes from order to chaos back to order. Steve-O drops the punk veneer and goes into law school to do damage from the inside the system, living more truly to the ideals of anarchy and rebellion. This also ties in with the presentation style which was displayed where Steve-O says, Exhibit A! Something that a lawyer would do. 
It's kind of something that was hinted from the beginning, that he wasn't going to stick with the anarchist lifestyle, and that he would actually follow in his father's footsteps, even if he did it in his own way. One life ends, and Steve-O's new life begins, where he has realized himself for who he is. Like Mark says, it's so easy to have everything taken away from you. It's all part of the cycle. I think this hits me harder now more than before as a teenager because I've gone through something very similar. This is going to get personal here, but here it goes. I was in a relationship for six years with someone who didn't deserve my affection. She and I planned on getting married and having kids since we were in high school. Trouble began to brew when we were having issues holding down a job simultaneously. Ultimately, she and I split up. This woman who I had given all of my attention, love, and affection to for six years dropped all of my foundation out from under my feet, and I didn't know what to do. But now I'm able to get back on track with my goals instead of worrying nonstop about a relationship that wasn't going to work out in the end anyway. I have a new life in a new state where I'm working on self-improvement every day so that when I am ready to focus on a relationship, I'll be ready to manage myself first because if I can't manage myself, I can't manage myself and a romantic relationship. You can't love someone if you don't love yourself. Things went from order to disorder, back to order. Granted, the world at large isn't in order, but that's something I'm sure you guys are trying to escape by watching this video. But with that, this is more relevant now than ever. Things will go back to order. The cycle. Well, hopefully with that explanation given and all of my thoughts on the movie, I hope that now you understand why this is absolutely one of my favorite movies of all time. This movie has and will continue to have a significant amount of meaning to me that I will be passing down to my children and passing on to as many friends as I can as long as I can as it is kind of the underdog of coming of age films and it's absolutely one that deserves to be celebrated more regularly than I've seen in the past. It is one that I highly recommend to anyone. It is one that will stay with me until the day I die. And SLC Punk is absolutely, 100%, a movie that doesn't suck. I'm sure you guys are all aware of what today's affiliate is about, but I'm going to give you a rundown on it just in case you weren't aware. I won't ever be affiliated with or sponsored by a company that I don't personally believe in or use, so keep that in mind. Private Internet Access is a VPN or virtual private network. It's a paid-for program that allows for encryption on your data so that you can keep yourself safe online. Everyone from hackers on a public Wi-Fi hotspot to your own internet service provider can see what you're doing online, and advertisers rely on your personal information that they take without your consent 24-7. If you want to fight against the wholesale of private information, get signed up for private internet access today for as little as $3 a month and keep your browsing and shopping private. Oh wait, wrong movie. Fight the system! Anarchy! Anarchy! Thank you for watching. While the first episode was meaningful to me, this one packs a lot more emotion and is much more personal to me. If you liked what you saw, then please click that like button. Get subscribed with notifications enabled, consider becoming my patron, or visit the sponsor page in the description. In case you want to keep up with me more frequently, I'm on Twitter most days retweeting people, I stream daily here on YouTube playing games, and I'm still on Reddit in case you want to try and talk to me there. Anyway guys, until next time, this is Retro Hellspawn signing out. Have a good one.